Welcome to another Drug Chug episode, and today we'll be talking about diuretics and how they work, plus some pharmacology. So let's get right into it. Okay, so I do want to give a quick disclaimer. This video is packed filled with information, but I promise if you go through this once, you'll know everything you need to know about diuretics. So first, we're going to start off with what is a diuretic. Then we'll talk about the generic adverse effects of all diuretics. Then we'll dive into the thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics with the mechanism of action and some of their side effects. Then we'll dive into the loop diuretics, their mechanism of action and side effects. And we'll talk about sulfur allergies that you might see in patients. Then we'll talk about our potassium sparing diuretics with the mechanism of action and side effects. Then we'll get into patient counseling and then a summary. And if you stick to the end, as always, we'll have a short quiz to see what you retained. So what exactly is a diuretic? Well, it's just something that causes diuresis which just means it makes you pee. And all pee is, is just water with some waste. And we already know that our kidneys filter our blood and they filter it for waste, which turns into our pee. The most important thing in our pee that we really focus on is sodium because water follows sodium. So the more sodium we have in our pee, the more water will follow, meaning the more pee we will pee. Our kidneys typically reabsorb or reuse about 98% of the sodium in our blood. So diuretics block the reabsorption of sodium, forcing the sodium to be peed out, meaning we force the sodium to stay in the pee, which forces water to follow and then we pee. So now that we know the point of diuretics is to keep sodium in our urine, well, now we have to see the different types of diuretics. And we only have three types. We have thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics. We have our loop diuretics. And then we have our potassium sparing diuretics. And we're gonna focus on each one throughout this video. So all three types of these diuretics cause these general adverse effects. And the first thing we see is they can cause dehydration, which makes sense because these diuretics make you pee. And if they work too well and you pee too much, you could become dehydrated. The second thing we see is they can cause electrolyte imbalance, which also makes sense because these agents cause you to waste sodium and some of the other agents cause you to waste other electrolytes like potassium, which we'll get into, causing you to have an electrolyte imbalance. The next thing we could see is that these diuretics can also cause muscle cramps. And the reason for this is because of the electrolyte imbalance. So if we waste too many electrolytes, it might cramp our patient's muscles. And then the last thing we might see is dizziness, which kind of makes sense because the diuretics make us lose volume because we're peeing so much, which decrease our blood pressure, which can cause them to become dizzy. So our very first class of diuretics is our thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics. And anytime you hear the word thiazide, the first thing your mind should go to is the distal convoluted tubule or the DCT. And this is the part of the kidney that these diuretics work on. So the very first agent we have here is hydrochlorothiazide, which is brand name microzide. And it's nice that the brand name actually matches up with the generic name. They both end in zide. And one thing to note is that hydrochlorothiazide is typically abbreviated as HCTZ for hydrochlorothiazide. And then our next agent is chlorothiazide. And this is brand name diuro. Again, it's a pretty clever brand name because it caused diuresis, so diuro. And both of these are our thiazide diuretics. So for our thiazide-like diuretics, our first product on market, we have our metolazone, which is brand name xeroxalin. We also have our adapamide, or brand name lozol. 
And then we have a product called chlorothaladone or a hygrotin. And these three here are our thiazide-like diuretics. Now the difference between thiazide diuretics and thiazide-like diuretics is just this chemical structure here. And this is called a thiazide. But keep in mind, both of these work at the distal convoluted tubule and they both do the same thing. Both of these diuretics work at the distal convoluted tubule section of our kidney to prevent sodium from being reabsorbed into the bloodstream. Because these agents cause diuresis, it makes sense that these are indicated for people with high blood pressure because once you start peeing more and more, your blood volume becomes less and less. And if you have less blood volume, you have less blood pressure. Now, this also makes sense that these agents are used for edema because you have excess fluid in your body and you start urinating more and more, you start getting rid of that excess fluid. I do want to note that for heart failure patients who have edema, typically metolazone is the go-to to help reduce that excess fluid. So we keep talking about thiazides and the distal convoluted tubule, so let's take a closer look. So if we look at this nephron or this kidney cell, what we could see is blood enters this area, this capsule, and blood is then filtered, causing urine to eventually leak out and the distal convoluted tubule is located right here. Typically, our body tries to be as efficient as possible, and our body wants to hold on to sodium chloride, water. It wants to hold on to these electrolytes. So what our thiazides do is they prevent the reabsorption of sodium chloride and water back into the blood at the distal convoluted tubule. And again, since there's more sodium in the tubule, then water follows, and then we urinate it out. Now, that's the first thing that these thiazide diuretics do, and that's the main thing to take from here. But there are a few other things that they also do that I'm going to just run through. The second thing is because there's so much sodium in our urine that there is a sodium-potassium exchanger, which pumps a little bit of sodium out, and then potassium into the urine, meaning we lower our potassium in our blood. The next thing we also do is at this section of the kidney, before we reach this loop, we have our thiazide diuretics actually promote calcium reabsorption, meaning it puts calcium from the urine back to the blood. And this could actually be very beneficial for our patients that have osteoporosis. Now, this is actually kind of weird because typically diuretics make us pee out all these electrolytes. But this is the exception to the rule. So the last thing that these thiazide diuretics do is they actually block the secretion of uric acid. Now, typically uric acid is built up in our body and then is transported through an active process into the urine but these thiazide diuretics actually block the transportation of uric acid from the blood to the urine which cause an increase in uric acid levels in our body which can be very problematic for patients who already have a high level of uric acid in their blood and typically patients with gout can't take these thiazide diuretics because they already have this increase of uric acid and it'll amplify their gout-like symptom. So these are the side effects that are specific to thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics. So first here we see that we'll see a decrease in serum sodium levels because we prevent the distal convoluted tubule from releasing sodium which is also known as hyponatremia. We also see a decrease in serum potassium levels, also known as hypokalemia, because remember, later on in the tubule, there's an exchanger that exchanges the sodium for a potassium back into the urine. We also see an increase in serum uric acid levels, 
And this is because these agents block the active transport of uric acid from the blood to the urine. And this is known as hyperuricemia. And the last thing here is an increase in blood glucose. And we didn't really talk about this in the slide before, but there's a chance that these thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics can actually increase our blood sugar levels. And this is called hyperglycemia. And one thing to note is we should watch this out for patients who are diabetic because we need to monitor their blood sugar. But this doesn't mean that these patients can't take a thiazide or thiazide-like diuretic. It just means we'd have to monitor them more closely. So that was a lot of information about thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics. I know it's dense and there's a lot going on, but that is probably the hardest diuretic to talk about and get out of the way. Now this video is getting a little long, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break it down into different pieces. So the next piece in part two, we'll talk about loop diuretics and I'll put the link in the description below. Until next time.